Understanding how to deal with security incidents are an important part of any security administrator's job. Security incidents can involve many different situations. For example, a user might click an attachment inside of an email that runs an executable and that installs malware onto their system. Or it may be that your WAN connection has been overwhelmed with a distributed denial of service attack done by botnets from people that are located anywhere in the world. Or maybe you have to deal with information that has been stolen or exfiltrated from your network and now the attackers want you to pay up before that information is made public. Or maybe a user has installed some software that would effectively allow someone from the outside to gain access to the inside private network. All of these security issues could occur in any organization at any time, so you have to be prepared for anything to happen. If you're interested on how organizations manage these types of security issues, you may want to read through the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The document is called the Special Publication 800-61 Revision 2, and the title of this is the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. This document takes you through the entire life cycle of incident handling, including the preparation, the detection and analysis, the containment, eradication and recovery, and any post-incident activities. Before an incident even occurs, there is a great deal of planning that takes place. One of the things you should have available is the list of communication methods. There should be an up-to-date contact list with all of the people who should be informed when an incident occurs. You also want to have an incident go bag where you have all of the hardware and software required to address any type of incident. This might have laptops with specialized software. There could be removable media for copying items from one system to another. You could have forensic software to be able to capture information on that system. And it might be a good idea to have some type of digital imaging system to be able to capture pictures and video. It's also a good idea to have a number of resources that can help during the incident. For example, you may need documentation of a particular server or perhaps some network diagrams. It might also be a good idea to have security baselines and to also have file hashes of all your critical files. It's also a good idea to know what you would use to be able to mitigate this particular incident, especially if you're dealing with malware or some other type of malicious software. It might be a good idea to have a known good operating system image or copies of application images so that you can replace the bad code with the known good software. And perhaps most importantly, there should be a set of policies and procedures that everyone will follow during one of these security incidents. Detecting a security incident is not something that is always easy to recognize. There may be different types of systems that are attacked during a security incident, and it may be difficult to simply look through the file system and determine if a security incident has occurred. Part of the problem is that if you're connected to the internet, there will be attacks on your systems constantly. And it might be difficult to determine if an attack is simply a script that's running or if this is a legitimate attack that has gained access to your systems. Even a security incident as common as a malware infection can be a relatively complex process. So you should make sure that you have the proper policies and procedures on how to look for these incidents and what to do when one's found. There are probably a number of logs that you could view right now that show instances where an attempt to attack your network was made. This can provide you with useful information about where attacks may be originating and what type of attacks they may choose to use. For example, a web server log can capture a great deal of information, especially when an attacker is going through a vulnerability scan against your web server. You should make sure you have a calendar so that you know when Microsoft is going to release their latest set of patches so that you can then begin the process of patching all of your systems and looking for anyone who may be attacking systems that have not already been patched. And in some cases, the attackers will contact you directly and let you know that they're trying to break into your systems. This may be uncommon, but it's not unheard of in the hacking community. It's obviously important to know when an attack occurs, and there may be things you can look at in your network that can give you a notification that an attack is underway. For example, you might get an alert from your intrusion prevention system that a buffer overflow attempt was made against a particular server. Or maybe an antivirus report is showing that malware has been installed on a particular user's workstation. You might also find a situation where an attacker has gained access to a system and begins making changes to the security configurations. If you have the proper monitoring in place, you'll be informed if any of these configuration changes are made.
And if you happen to find a large increase in network traffic, that could indicate that an attacker is trying to move a large amount of data out of your network and into the hands of the attacker. If you do find that an attack is underway, you should try to stop that attack as quickly as possible. This is not a situation where you might want to wait to see what the attacker might do. Some security systems will provide a way to test for an attack inside of a sandbox. A sandbox is a closed system where you can run applications and see what the result of running that application might be. A good example is loading malware into a sandbox, running that malware, and seeing what part of the operating system was changed when that malware executes. Sometimes the process of isolating the malware to a sandbox can cause the malware itself to act differently. For example, a malware could recognize that it's being run inside of a virtual machine with limited network connectivity, and if it ever finds itself in that situation, it simply deletes itself. Once the incident is over, we need to go into recovery mode. Recovery mode means that we need to get rid of anything that may be bad software and replace that with known good software. This means if we have malware, we may want to remove the malware or simply re-image that system. We may need to disable any user accounts that were breached or created by the attacker. And we need to fix any vulnerabilities that allowed that attacker to get into our network in the first place. If we have known good backups, we may want to use those to overwrite anything that may have been changed by the attackers. Or we may want to use the original installation media to completely reinstall the operating system. The goal is to replace any files that may have been compromised and then lock everything down so the attackers can't get back in. After an attack is over is also a good time for reflection and to understand what may have occurred and how we can do better next time. A good place to do this is in the post-incident meeting. This is a meeting where everyone can be in the same room, discuss the topics associated with the incident, and come up with ways to resolve the issue more efficiently next time. These types of meetings are best done as soon as possible after the incident was resolved. This allows the people who participated in the incident to have a better memory of what happened. And we can also have better plans now when the next incident occurs. During this post-incident analysis, we may want to ask some difficult questions, such as, what exactly happened during this particular incident? What was the timeline that took place from the very beginning of the incident all the way until the end? It would also be interesting to see how well our planning process worked. We should be able to look at the documentation of this incident and see if the process that we followed was the best choice for this particular situation. We can then make decisions on what we might do different next time and then integrate those changes into our incident planning process. It might also be useful to know if we missed any of the indicators that might have warned us that this incident was going to occur. And if we did miss something, we might want to change our monitoring so that we're looking at some additional indicators. All of the planning and training that goes into incident response needs to take place before an incident occurs. Once the incident is live and on your network, it's too late to do any type of on-the-job training. There needs to be extensive documentation and testing of that documentation so that everyone knows what to do during an incident. This means that we would have to understand what happens during the initial response, what are the plans for investigation when an incident is identified, what is the process for reporting on this incident, and so on. In large organizations, especially those with multiple incident response teams, this training and planning process can be relatively expensive. But you may find that all of the resources and money put into the training process may save you money when a big incident occurs.